Dean Stevenson, I was just saying hi to our guest. I felt yes, like we how were, are you? If this was if we were in real life, we would certainly be talking to her. So I <laughs> I thought I would imitate real life. Absolutely. Some sense of normalcy. There you go. <laughs> are you in Seattle or is that just the book behind you? No, that's just my book from, from Seattle Sports. I'm actually in Maryland. So I used to teach at University of Washington. That's right, because you're at Hood College. Are you I am. That's do, right. Are you near there or are you somewhere else? No, I'm right here in Frederick. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, but I'm on sabbatical, so I'm not on campus this semester. Oh, wow. So you're ducking. You're, I, have an, I have another friend who's been on sabbatical sort of through the whole COVID thing. She's like, I'm so glad. <laughs> right? It's, it's really fortunate timing. <laughs> yeah. Thing. Amazing. <laughs> I taught virtually last semester, but yeah. So this is the big, this is your first, you have two semesters of sabbatical? So I just did essentially one semester, but then, you know, the nine months, so I'll begin again in the fall. Yeah. In a year. Now that I, in metro. We're going to go ahead and get started. Oh, okay. Okay. Is this it on participants? Uh, I think you are. Okay. Virtually, yes. Good evening. I want to welcome you to another of the presentations we've done this year for the Social Justice and Civic Engagement Committee. My name is Dr. Marshall Stevenson. I'm the Dean of the School of Education, Social Sciences and the Arts. And throughout the course of this year, beginning in August, Dr. Heidi Anderson, our president, felt it very important that given the events of last summer that we continue to keep our student body and students engaged and all the major events that are happening in our country, even as we speak today. So since last September, we've had a series of speakers, dialogues, presentations uh, that have featured a number of nationally, internationally known and American scholars to talk about a variety of subjects. Tonight is no different as we are going to uh, listen to Dr. Terry Ann Scott talk about the role of the black athlete. Uh, I would ask that once the presentation is over, if you have a question for Dr. Scott, that you would put that in the chat and we'll allow the presentation to go forward and then address your question at the end. Um, before we begin, I'm going to kind of set the stage for what we're going to listen to tonight. And then we're going to have a formal introduction of Dr. Scott by the shared gift. When most people consider the modern civil rights movement in the United States, usually images of Dr. King, Fannie Lou Hamer, Emmett Till, boycotts, sit-ins, street protests, police, biting dogs, fire hoses, Birmingham, Selma, the Voting Rights Act, these all come to mind. We usually see this period and the movement as one of mass social protests for social justice in every area of American life, socially, politically, and economically. We sometimes dwell on the movement's Southern focus and forget that there was just as much racism and oppression in the North as anywhere else. Indeed, the entire nation witnessed for decades and decades the persecution of African-Americans and the continuing denial of basic human rights. The actions of former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick several years ago, taking a knee during the national anthem to highlight police brutality, unpunished murders, and the overall injustices African-Americans continue to experience, elicited a firestorm of controversy from the stadiums to the White House. In a way, Kaepernick started a movement of his own, one that has resulted in ending his professional career. But nonetheless, a movement that mobilized not just black athletes, but white teammates and allies as well. As we are all experiencing in our nation today, the civil rights movement is far from over. Our speaker tonight is going to tell an important story that is often overlooked in the series of events and famous figures that I listed at the outset. The role of the black athlete in social protest in America. The black athlete has been just as involved in the freedom struggle as any other protester. Indeed, one of the most iconic pictures that Dr. Scott will show us 
of all time symbolizing the civil rights movement and the role of the black athlete is none other than Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, raising black glove fists, silent gestures, as Smith would later call their actions, that so many people around the world misunderstood. Thankfully, Dr. Scott is going to help us understand why their actions and that of so many other black athletes is critical in the march towards social justice in American society today. So Ms. Gill, would you please come and introduce Dr. Scott? Thank you, Dr. Terry Ann Scott is an Associate Professor of American History and Director of African American Studies at Hood College in Maryland. Her research is her research and teaching interests focus largely on African-American social and cultural history, the intersection of sports and race, and political and social movements. Dr. Scott earned her doctorate in history from the University of Chicago. She regularly lectures about race, sports, and social movements around the country and appears frequently on public radio. Dr. Scott is the author of several books and articles. Lynching and Leisure, Race, and the Transformation of Violent Mobs in Texas will be released at the end of the year. Dr. Scott's apology, Seattle Sports, Play, Identity, and the Pursuit of Credibility in the Inner City is part of an award-winning series, series on sports and culture. Her latest work is the authorized biography on Winnie Wilkins entitled From Bed Style to Hall of Fame, The Unexpected Life of Winnie Wilkins. She is heavily involved in community service, social activism, and social activism. She's the director and founder of Community Ambassador Mentor Program, which connects college students, particularly students athletes, with economically marginalized local youth. Dr. Scott is the co-founder of Anti-Racist Team Up, which is a program that teaches college and high school educators how to discuss race and racism with their students. Additionally, she is the co-founder of Race Cafe, a program that brings students and faculty together on college campus to discuss issues related to race and determine how to create necessary cultural shifts and work to dismantle racism in local environments. Dr. Sky is resident historian for Project Pilgrimage, an organization that takes groups of people on journeys to the Deep South to explore the history of the modern civil rights movement. She is also a scholar and resident for Common Power, a civic engagement organization. Dr. Sky is currently helping the school district in Frederick County to rework the social studies curriculum for K-12 to make it more inclusive of African-American history. Dr. Scott has recently has received numerous awards and recognition for her research, teaching, and community outreach. Uh, Dr. Scott, you're muted. Indeed I am. I wanted to make sure to not have the feedback. So I'll say again, I appreciate the beautiful introduction. Thanks so much. And I'm really happy to be here this evening to talk about a very timely topic, Revolt of the Black Athlete, Then and Now. Uh, my books were already mentioned, so I just thought I'd put them up here for a moment for you all to see. The Lynching and Leisure book will be out in the fall. If anyone is interested in getting information on that, you can uh, sign up for it at lynchingandleisure.com or, and also get a little snippet of what the book will be about. And then I'm currently writing the biography on Lenny Wilkins. Some of the younger folks in the room may not know who Lenny Wilkins is, so I encourage you to look him up. I'll actually mention him momentarily and for just a minute while we are talking this evening. So I wanted to start with this. And I'm going to ask everyone to, for a moment, take a deep breath, to breathe, to be present. I'm going to switch my view here. To be present, to remain present. I know that we have a lot going on and we have our phones and, and distractions and I understand that. If we can remain present and try to kind of absorb the information that we're going to learn tonight. And I encourage you to ask questions and to provide comments. If you have questions that you want to ask about something I'm talking about in the particular moment, please feel free to add that to the chat. I'm fine with being interrupted or we can wait until the end to take questions. And I want you to think about the power of you. So one of the things I love about history and really when we talk about the history of sports and athletes and those who made a difference is thinking about if they could do this, 
I can do anything. So thinking about not only the challenges that they face and how it can carry you through your life, but also about the activism and what one person can do and what the collective can do. So you are a part of this story. And I encourage you to have something for notes or a reflection to jot something that you'd like to learn something more about. So in our conversation this evening, I have some central questions that we will focus on. And one of those will be, how has the intersection of sports, of race and sports existed as a microcosm of macro social and political issues, challenges and triumphs? Because we find that that's what sports are. Sports are a reflection of our own society. Why and how were or are black athletes criticized for their political consciousness, social activism? You'll see me go back and forth a lot for we and are because we are going to talk about the historical continuum. We're going to look at the past and think about how it impacts our present. How does the concept of staying in one's place factor into a discussion related to athletes and activism? We'll spend some time on this because when we talk about a revolt of an athlete, it has much to do with this concept of placism and how it relates to race. Why were and are their actions considered a revolt there's a historical connection there. We're going to go through several points as to why it's considered a revolt. And we'll spend the most time on the historical connection and we'll be able to uh, do that through a story boxing. Why was, is their voice powerful and necessary? And in that last one, I'd like to hear from all of you as well so that we can have a discussion and think about why the voice of the black athlete is powerful and necessary. And so the structure of the lecture, as I've mentioned, is a back and forth essentially between then and now, and then we'll spend some time in the past as we near ourselves to getting to the end. I'm going to start with the now and these modern pictures. And I'm gonna start with it for a very particular reason. So here is an image of the WNBA donning these white t-shirts and the holes on the back represent seven bloodied bullet holes. And those are the seven holes that were shot into the back of Jacob Blake in Canosa, Wisconsin. And the women of the NBA wore those shirts in protest of what was happening to make people speak up and take notice and create change. And I also will start with this image, the National Women's Soccer League, and then taking a knee. And the league itself tweeting, in case you haven't heard, Black Lives Matters. Why do I want to start with these images? Number one, because the history of athletics is heavily male dominated. That's just the nature of sports in this country. And so whenever possible, I want to integrate the accomplishments of women into this. The other reason why I wanted to show these two images is because we're talking about the black athlete this evening and the history of the black athlete. But it is important to note that non-black athletes, athletes from other races and ethnicities have also joined in this struggle. And so I wanna make sure to acknowledge the importance of that. But we'll start our examination here with a quote from a former person who was formerly known as Lou Alcindor, otherwise known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. In 1967, at a founding meeting of, the, meeting of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, he said this, everybody knows me. I'm the big basketball star, the weekend hero. Everybody's all American. Well, last summer, I was almost killed by a racist cop shooting at a black man in Harlem. He was shooting on the street where masses of people were standing around or just taking a walk, but he didn't care. After all, we were just N-words. We catch hell because we are black. Somewhere each of us has got to take a stand against this kind of thing. This is how I make my stand, using what I have, and I take my stand here. And so Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's comment becomes exemplary of a whole shift in the political consciousness of black athletes in the 1960s. There was such a remarkable and visible shift that a Sports Illustrated article took note of it in 1968. And that's where this phrase comes from initially, the revolt of the black athlete. This article said, what is happening today amounts to a revolt by the black athlete against the framework and attitudes of American sport. And that such a thing could occur in his own pet province has astonished white sports followers. The reason for the astonishment is that the man in the grandstands knows nothing about the Negro athlete whom he professes to understand. And he goes on to talk about a wall of ignorance that the fan is shaded from the realities of a black athlete's existence. And we can see the parallel already because black athletes who speak out today are still subject to demonization, to admonishment in large measure because people perhaps are not willing or understanding the kind of collective identity that those black athletes have and how things impact them. But that's one of the things we'll unpack this evening. And so that phrase from that 1968 Sports Illustrated article, the use of the word revolt of the black athlete 
was taken by Dr. Harry Edwards, who has been a mainstay in the sociology of sports, who ended up teaching at the University of California, Berkeley, and now is a consultant for the NFL. He was the main architect of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, which was part of that 1968 protest in Mexico City, which we'll talk about later. Inspired by Malcolm X, he named his book, The Revolt of the Black Athlete, and he said it was inevitable that this revolt of the Black athlete should develop. With struggle being waged by Black people in areas of education, housing, employment, and others, it was a matter of time before Afro-American athletes shed their fantasies and delusions and asserted themselves and faced the facts of their existence. So why is it a, re a revolt? And how does that look today? We're going to talk more about that. But what's happening in the state of Black athletics and Black athletes in the 1960s to create this? Well, we got a taste of it with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's quote and with these comments coming out of these publications. But Black athletes are fighting two things. So number one, they're refuting stereotypes still in the 1960s about ability and intelligence. You might see this first picture here. And I'm sure, does anyone know automatically who that is? I have students who say to me, that's Sierra's husband. I would actually call him Russell Wilson, but some people know him only as Sierra's husband. So that's fine. That's Russell Wilson. The reason why I have his picture there is because he is the second black quarterback to win a Super Bowl. Now, if you didn't know that, that's great. That's a sign of progress. That means that it's become normalized. But in the 1960s, it was not normalized. As a matter of fact, somebody like Warren Moon, who won the Rose Bowl for the University of Washington, quarterback who won the Rose Bowl, not a single NFL team, would draft him because they were considering black athletes not smart enough to be quarterbacks, not smart enough to be middle linebackers. The second image you see here is the Texas Western Miners. They were now of UTEP. They won the championship in 1966 against the University of Kentucky Powerhouse. And they did it by only playing five black players because at the time people charged that five black players were not smart enough to play at once and win. And so they were acting as their own activists, as civil rights activists, in trying to turn over the stereotypes. So that's the first thing that's happening in the 1960s. What's the second thing? The second thing is, well, what do we do? What types of activism should we engage in and should we engage in activism? And so everybody had their own idea of what to do at the time. So then why was it classified as a revolt? <clears throat> there are four points that I'm going to argue about being classified as a revolt. And we'll talk about each one. We'll spend the most time on number four. And then we will kind of wrap it up at that point begin to look at these modern iterations and hopefully have a broader conversation together. So the first one would be they're told to accept the status quo and have one identity, one consciousness, to bury other parts of themselves and be one thing. So we're going to break these down and go through each one. Number two, a refusal to stay in one's place. They're revolting against the notion of place. They're revolting in number three against injustice. And in the fourth one, it's a shift in how black athletes have historically moved, maneuvered in the public space. And that's where we're gonna get into a famous story about boxing to think about how that functions. And so the first one we're gonna conquer is this identity and consciousness. This idea that black athletes are told to accept the status quo and have one identity, one consciousness. Well, you probably didn't expect to see W.E.B. Du Bois in this, but I'm going to talk about him in terms of something I call a triple consciousness. So many of you may be familiar with Du Bois' double consciousness. He first writes about it in this article in 1897 in The Atlantic, and then it becomes one of his articles, his essays, in The Souls of Black Folks. And he talks about the moment when he has this racial realization, when he discovers essentially that he is Black in this world because of the way that a little white girl treated him or mistreated him. And he says he has two options. He can go down two paths. He can internalize that idea that he is less than and allow it to destroy him or he can take another path and he can beat everyone in everything that they do and be the best. Thank God for us he chose that because he went on to find found uh, co-founder of the NAACP and a number of organizations. And so he says in that article, I have two consciousness. I am American and I should be able to have all of those things that Americans have. I should be able to be brought into the fold of democracy and have all of those rights. But I'm black and by nature of being black, I am denied many of those rights. So how do I reconcile those two consciousness? So I would argue that an athlete has a third consciousness. They have the idea of being American and all that that is supposed to mean, being black and much of what that carries for them, the good and the bad, as far as the bad in terms of maneuvering through a world that often sees them as a threat. 
and a third consciousness of being a lionized existence, of being an athlete, of thinking about what it means to be able to have this fame and fortune, but it often doesn't matter when a different consciousness takes over, when they are also black in America. They are often burdened and both driven by this consciousness. And I say that there's another one, a triple consciousness, when we add gender and gender identity to the idea. So how does this triple consciousness play out? Well, I have an opportunity here to talk about Lenny Wilkins, and that's who I'm writing the biography for. And so this is a collaborative effort. I've had a wonderful opportunity to interview him on many, many occasions. And he talks about this kind of triple consciousness. Now, this is a man who's a three-time Naismith Hall of Fame inductee, only person in the country to ever be inducted three times as a player, as a coach, as a coach for the Dream Team. When he played for the St. Louis Hawks in the early 1960s, he talks about how he'll be cheered and keel at auditorium as this wonderful basketball star. But then when he goes out into the city of St. Louis, they wouldn't even let him into restaurants because he's Black. So he's cheered on in one form and admonished in another. He also talks about when he moved into a white neighborhood, it didn't matter that he was the great Lenny Wilkins. Somebody poisoned his dog to get rid of him. And if any of you saw the show Them that's currently airing, you'll remember the scene where they kill a dog to try to get rid of the family. That's exactly what happened to him. So how did he reconcile these identities? Well, he would go into those restaurants that told him he couldn't enter and sit down and dare people to tell him he had to leave. And they never did. The triple consciousness exists today. This is a picture from Robert Ory, who in August of 2020 gave a heart-filled, tear-filled admission. He said, it's hard to tell your 14-year-old son that I worry about him when he walks out that door. I have a 21-year-old son. I worry about him because Black men are endangered species. It's amazing to me why we keep loving this country and this country does not love us back. It didn't matter that he's the great Robert Ory, a former Laker, a current analyst, he still had the fears of his sons being killed because they are black men in America. And if you don't choose an identity, an identity has been chosen for you. The great example of this would be Richard Sherman. Now I should admit that I am, I've lived in Seattle for years, so Seahawks are my number one team. I remember this very clearly. When he tipped the ball that was being tossed to Crabtree from the 49ers and afterwards, he had an outburst where he said, you know, I'm number one, I'm great, which is absolutely fine. But he was demonized for it. He was called a thug in the press repeatedly because he chose to assert himself and say, yeah, I'm good at what I do. And so he openly came out and said, you know, being called a thug is equivalent today for somebody calling me the N-word. They're attempting to keep me in my place. They are telling me you choose an identity that we think you should have. You stay in your place, which takes us to the concept of place in this idea of a revolt. A refusal to stay in one's place render or renders activism among black athletes a revolt. So I should tell you now that there are some images on this that are quite graphic and a couple of them are coming up soon. Stepping outside of one's place, a criminal act. Now here we're gonna talk about place in two ways. You probably didn't think we would see lynching in this conversation, but we will in a couple of places. Place functions in two overlapping ways. Number one, remaining silent and not protesting is staying in your place. All of you have heard the admonishments of these athletes today. I'm paying to see a game, you need to stay out of politics. Your black body essentially, what the subtext is, is one intended for entertainment and you need to remain in your place. The second idea of place is the patrolling of racial boundaries, of staying in your place or suffering the consequences. And so here is where I talk about crime is not static. It is defined by historical processes. What do I mean by that? If we think about crime today and what a really heinous crime is, we think about murder or arson that leads to murder or home invasion. But historically, crime in a post-emancipation society after slavery ends, when Black people are made to kind of remain in a particular space on the racial hierarchy, crime becomes anything from voting to trying to make people immigrate to dating outside of their race. Crime becomes something that is part of a Black expression. And the reason why I have this postcard here is because if you look at the reasons for lynching, then you see how stepping outside of one's place is considered a crime. And so the poem itself says, this is the branch of a dogwood tree, an emblem of white supremacy, a lesson once taught 
in the pioneer school that it is a land of white man's rule. The red man once in an early day was told by the whites to mend his way. The Negro must by eternal grace must learn to stay in the Negro's place. Black athletes are asked to ignore the continued lethal patrolling of racial boundaries. Blackness is still in our society frequently considered a crime. These athletes are asked to stay in their place, to ignore, for instance, the lynching of Ahmaud Arbery last February that didn't come to light until June when he was simply running down a street in a white neighborhood. And when the 911 operator inquired of Gregory McDaniel, McMichael what was the crime being committed, he said, there's a black male running down my street. And after Travis McMichael shot him and was standing over Ahmaud Arbery's body, he exclaimed that effing N-word. They are asked to ignore this, George Floyd, and to not say anything and to just continue to be an athlete and not worry about what we saw unfold and thank God for the verdict of last week. They are asked to ignore the patrolling of racial boundaries that led this woman several months ago to accuse a 14-year-old black boy in a hotel in New York City of stealing her phone a phone that she had actually left in an Uber, and the manager automatically took her side as she wrestled that 14-year-old boy to the ground. Number three, racism and structural inequality. It was considered a revolt because it was a revolt against racial terror and injustice. A racial terror and injustice that has a long history in this country. From the burning of black bodies, to the commuting of pictures of those images of lynchings to postcards. 5,000 black bodies burned or, or hanged or shot over the course of American history. Racialized violence during the modern civil rights movement. Those black athletes who were revolting in that moment, they knew what was happening. Many of them were in those streets. These are people in Birmingham, Alabama, who were simply marching to make sure that the stores were integrated. It's important for us to understand the historical context, the context of the racial terror and structural inequality that occurs that creates the necessity for these athletes to speak out. Again, an image from Birmingham, one that circulated the world of people once again marching to be integrated into society. The rejection of school integration. The beating of people, including this from 1965, Amelia Boynton, simply for attempting to register people to vote. Jim Brown said the time dictated the passion in all of us. Brown, who was a former running back from the Cleveland Browns, who would eventually leave the NFL, some say at the height of his career, to become more involved in community activism. One of the organizations he would start was the Black Economic Union in Cleveland in 1967. And so it is a continued revolt against continued racial injustice. Remember the images I just showed you? I could show those again, but we saw them of Ahmaud Arbery. We think about McLean, Breonna Taylor, this incident that just happened, that just became public, I should say, of a, of an, uh, a gentleman who's in the army being harassed and beaten and pepper sprayed by police officers. Mass incarceration and racial disparities in sentencing that plague our communities. This is just one example. Blacks are sentenced to a longer time in jail for nonviolent drug crimes than whites are for violent crimes. Those athletes who protest are existing and understanding the disparities in funding and punishment for children of color in education. One of the things that led LeBron James to create this free school called the I Promise School for economically marginalized youth in Akron. Ohio. And so what is the fourth one? And this is the one we'll sit with, with just a while, for just a while. By 1968, when Sports Illustrated and Dr. Harry Edwards are talking about the roots of a revolt, when they're saying this is a revolt of the Black athlete, what are they referencing? Well, we can talk about all the things we just talked about, but at its core is this, a shift in how Black athletes have historically maneuvered in the public sphere. This is an image of Jack Johnson, and it'll become clearer what we're saying. So by sports in the 1960s, and here you see an image of Bill Russell and of Wilma Rudolph, and both of them we'll talk about uh, just a bit more. By sports in the 1960s, you have a new paradigm, a new athlete, an activist athlete. 
why was it new is the question. What came before them to characterize it as a revolt? Well, number one, we have to remember this, that African-Americans were banned from most sporting leagues, but they didn't just sit quietly and fall by the wayside. They created their own organizations like the American Tennis Association featured here. But the other reason it's considered a revolt is because by the 1960s, previous to that, a model black athlete had become the expected, not necessarily the accepted, but the expected norm. They had to adopt socially acceptable personalities, a particular persona, so that they would be accepted into mainstream sports, no longer excluded. They did not, they were not allowed to engage in political activity. And why was this necessary? Because it was necessary to re-enter these mainstream sports. Now I have an image here of Jackie Robinson and there's something that needs to be understood about this. It was necessary. Many of you know the story of Jackie Robinson. He had to sign a contract to not fight back when he integrated the Brooklyn Dodgers. And this was not who he was. There's an image of him in the army because he was not one to take any kind of abuse. He was nearly court-martialed for refusing to give up a seat on a bus once. And so this was very challenging for him. But why was it necessary for this kind of athlete to be created in the 1930s and 50s, through the 1930s and 1950s to reintegrate sports? Well, it's because of something I call the Rosa Parks syndrome. Rosa Parks was not the first person to refuse to give up her seat on the bus. She wasn't even the first person that year. Several people had been arrested before her. She was a good one for the face of the movement because there was nothing about her that they could find that they could use to malign her character in the public. Much like Jackie Robinson, he was an upstanding citizen. They couldn't malign his character in the public. Now, what if Jackie had fought back? What if he had beaten somebody up? Many of us would say, well, he would perfectly been within his right to do so, especially if you understand what happened to him. But if he did, it would have ruined it for everyone else. They would have said, see, black people can't be in the league and Grant Rickey and Jackie Robinson understood that. But this is an example, and this is an actual letter that he received. We've already gotten rid of several like you, one found in a river just recently. So he had constant threats to his life. But it must be understood that creating a particular type of athlete was needed, was necessary. And Jackie Robinson, and this is a former uh, Negro League player, would say this, Jackie helped us by the manner in which he kept himself in control. He knew what the price was going to be. We all tried to emulate Jackie, his demeanor, taking and enduring this to reach our goal. We had to take abuse, turn the other cheek. All the guys patterned themselves after Jackie. They may have gotten to the point where they wanted to quit and they just thought about Jackie. I know I did. That would give me some sort of lift. We were the early crusaders through the South and Jackie was with us. And that's absolutely right. Jackie Robinson was necessary and so was Joe Lewis. Why? Well, the story that I've been promising you about boxing comes into play here. Why was it a revolt? Why did they have to create a particular type of model athlete, often referred to as a noble Negro athlete, at a particular historical moment? Well, we can start to illustrate that and understand it through juxtaposing Jack Johnson with Joe Lewis. Well, who is Jack Johnson? Jack Johnson was the first American heavyweight boxing champion, one of my favorite people to talk about. And what happened to him reveals how attempts to reify, to strengthen a racial hierarchy often invaded sports. It also demonstrates how boxing and the relationship between racial identity and sports played out in American society and how white supremacy attempted to stymie black success in sports. Jack Johnson was from Galveston, Texas. He was the son of former slaves and he started boxing in what were called battle royales. You might be familiar with the term either from Ellison's Invisible Man or if you watched the movie about uh, James Brown, they showed a battle royale where often white men would take small black children off the street, blindfold them and have them fight bare knuckle to each other and bet on who would win. He ends up becoming heavyweight champion because he beats Tommy Burns, the white heavyweight champion. And he had to follow him all the way to Australia because white fighters would not fight black people in America. So in 1908, he follows him there. They paid Burns $30,000 to fight him. Quite a handsome sum at the time, even now, but even more so at the time. And Jack Johnson beats him and becomes heavyweight champion. And then he would defy all societal notions of place. He would grate on the nerves of many in white America 
Number one, by dating white women very openly. By what people felt was flaunting his wealth with his cars and his fur coats. There's this wonderful story that he tells about a police officer where he's driving too fast. And at the time, maybe that was 26 miles an hour. I say that not in jest. And the police officer stopped him and said, I'm going to take you in unless you give me some money. Give me $50. And so Jack Johnson gives him 100 And the officer said, well, I told you just to give me 50 And Johnson said, well, I'm coming back through this way. So keep the change for my way back. He received death threats by mail, constantly subject to racial slurs, often admonished in the mainstream newspapers. And how did African-Americans feel about him? Some took issue with his dating patterns, but many, many others felt that him as a heavyweight champion was an extension of themselves in an era where they say black people were not intelligent enough, were not strong enough to succeed in sports. They said Jack Johnson demonstrated the fallacy of that. Well, the calls came out very quickly for the great white hope. Jim Jeffries, who was the former champion previous to Tommy Burns, must now emerge from his alfalfa farm and remove the golden smile from Jack Johnson's face, said the famous writer, Jack London. Jeff, it's up to you. The white man must be rescued. Calls for the great white hope went out. People wanted Jim Jeffries to come out of retirement and to fight Jack Johnson. He had retired the champion, and so people argued because he never actually lost, he was still the champion. So he lost 100 pounds, got off of his alfalfa farm that he was living on, and went to go and fight Jim Jeffries, and he, or Jack Johnson. And he said this, I'm going into this fight for the sole purpose of proving that a white man is better than a Negro. And really, that's how the nation viewed it. It was a contest between Black and white. Race and manliness were at stake. Manliness, a phrase we hear a lot at that turn of the century era. So they fight what was called the fight of the century in July of 1910, on July 4th. There were 15 rounds that end with Jim Jeffries being knocked out. You see how many people are there in the desert. The Chicago Defender, a black newspaper said, Johnson was the first Negro to be admitted the best man in the world. That phrase alone tells you what was at stake at that particular moment. So what were the reactions nationwide to Johnson's victory? Well, black people celebrated. Number of whites across the country killed and attacked black people. There were racial massacres in cities from north to south. This was not simply a boxing match. Theaters refused to show the film of the fight. States outlawed interracial boxing contests. Anti-misogenation laws, those are laws that say you cannot date outside of your race, were introduced in northern states as a result. And the Mann Act, often called the White Slavery Act, that prevented someone from taking a woman across state boundaries for illicit purposes, was enforced against him. They said that he forced a woman who was his girlfriend to go over state lines with him. Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis sentenced him to jail. That would be the first baseball commissioner and the same man who was vehemently opposed to integration of the major leagues. Johnson would leave the country and when he came back, he was a criminal. Enter Joe Lewis, also known as the Brown Bomber. 69 victories, 55 knockouts. He was the second heavyweight champion. He was beloved, but why was he beloved while Jack Johnson was despised? Well, this is why, we'll get into that. So he's born in Alabama. His father was a sharecropper. His grandparents, sharecropper, were slaves. He moves to Detroit to an area called the Black Bottom, which was where most African-Americans lived in Detroit at the time. And he was supposed to be taking violin lessons. His mother gave him money for violin lessons, but she found out soon that he was actually taking that money and paying for boxing lessons. She was not very happy about that. Well, when he started to get better and better, his Black trainers and managers began to groom him. They wanted him to be successful. They wanted him to be accepted by white America. They wanted him to not be anything like the former heavyweight champion, Jack Johnson. As a matter of fact, when Jack Johnson would go to a Joe Lewis camp, he wasn't even allowed to enter. They told him, knock out your opponents so you don't risk a decision. Don't gloat. Don't smile over your opponents. Just say that you were lucky. Never brag about what you did. And so that's what he did. And they hired a white promoter to promote him. And he became beloved in the country. And when he became the champion, he said, when I walked in the church, you'd have thought I was the second coming of Christ. 
The pastor talked about how God gave certain people gifts and through my fighting, I was to uplift the spirit of my race. I must make the whole world know that Negro people were strong, fair, and decent. He said I was one of the chosen. I thought to myself, am I all that? And he was not only the chosen among Black Americans, but Americans in general. And part of that was the historical context. He fought in the Great Depression, where people were looking for some level of power and uplift. And he fought two key component, opponents, Primo Canera and Max Schmeling, one who was Italian and one who was German. Now, why is that relevant? because that was just before America entered or several years before America entered World War II. And so you have these Axis powers brewing, one was Italy and one was Germany. And so his ability to beat them was seen as America beating Italy and America beating Germany. Nationalism seemed to quiet racism. The famed head coach of Gramlin State, Eddie Robinson said this, Joe Lewis was considered an American hero. He said it was the first time he had ever heard a black person referred to as an American when the Newton radio talked about Joe Lewis. Now, as an aside, Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling actually became great friends until they passed. And here's Joe Lewis with Muhammad Ali. What my father did was enable white America to think of him as an American, said Joe Lewis Jr., not as a black. By winning, he, was, he became America's first black hero. He started movies, he owned a restaurant, he sold a soda line. He bore no resemblance to Jack Johnson. So what was the result of Joe Lewis? The result of Joe Lewis was a new, more acceptable black athlete, one who could be revered and not condemned. Yes, it was necessary at that historical moment. And sometimes one can argue it's still relevant that if you stay in a particular box, you are accepted. So why was the activism of black athletes in the 1960s considered a revolt? Because the private Joe Lewis, who was used to promote the war, who was considered acceptable was a far cry from two black men with the black leather gloves standing on a podium in the 1968 Mexico Olympics with a black power stance, calling attention to racial injustice in the United States. And that's what Tommy Smith and John Carlos did. The third person on the stand is Australian Peter Norman. If you look at the picture, each of them is bearing a white circular patch. That is a patch from the Olympic Project for Human Rights. Dr. Harry Edwards, who started the book, The Revolt of the Black Athlete, started that organization. Peter Norman said, I'll wear that patch in support of you guys. What was the consequence? Well, Peter Norman was completely blacklisted when he moved back to Australia simply for wearing that patch in support of them. Tommy Smith and John Carlos had their medals stripped from them and they were told to leave the Mexico City Olympic Village within 24 hours. Now there was a Czech gymnast who also protested that same Olympics because of the invasion of her country. While she stood on the podium, she would look down and ignore the flags that were flying, but she was not treated in the same way. This was a racialized treatment. Joe Lewis was a far cry from Bill Russell who said who would wear his uh, goatee simply to unnerve white people, according to himself, who didn't drive a Cadillac so he wouldn't feed into a stereotype at the time, who in 1963, after the assassination of civil rights leader Medgar Ever feature here in the top, held the first interracial basketball camp in Mississippi. It was so dangerous what he did that Charles Evers, Medgar's brother, stayed up all night in the hotel with a gun to make sure nobody would try and kill the great Bill Russell. Joe Lewis was a far cry from Elgin Baylor. The Minneapolis Lakers, when he played for them, refused in 1959 to suit up for a game. And you see him here sitting there because he was refused accommodations at a Charleston, West Virginia hotel because he was black. The whole team had to move to a black hotel, which they did willingly. The Lakers were fully in support of his decision. And certainly it was a far cry from Muhammad Ali, who because he refused to join the Vietnam War, a war that was still popular in some ways at the time and had become increasingly popular after in 1966, or increasingly unpopular after in 1966, was stripped of his title because he refused to be inducted into the American army to go and fight in a war where he said none of them ever called him the N-word. I had to prove you could be a new kind of black man, said Ali. I had to show that to the world. Those are the athletes 
whom are referred to as the ones revolting, revolting against a standard idea of what an athlete is supposed to be. And there's a historical continuum as we wrap up in our last few minutes and then we'll get to some questions of black athlete protests. Black athletes continue to speak up against racism and racial violence. And it's still viewed as a revolt in both a positive and negative way by many. And there are still consequences to that activism. We know that very clearly with what happened to Colin Kaepernick. He was essentially blackballed from, kicked out of the league, was unable to get a position, but he has become very much so a symbol of courage and what it means to protest. To the point where over the past year, the commissioner who had so criticized him publicly, Goodell, recently apologized for the way that he treated him because he too, it seems, has had a level of a racial awakening in the, in the aftermath of George Floyd's lynching, in the aftermath of a pandemic that has disproportionately killed people of color in watching racial unrest in this country. But they are still criticized in much the same way in the 1960s and still they push on. Black athletes who engage in social and racial justice endeavors are often referred to as ungrateful, such as former Republican Congressman from Illinois, Joe Walsh called black athletes who are engaging in racial injustice acts or engaging in acts to uh, dismantle racial injustice. He said they're ungrateful millionaire athletes who said America is racist and he said they're wrong, America's not racist. He even went as far as to call Stevie Wonder another ungrateful black multimillionaire because Stevie Wonder took a knee during the national anthem. What's the subtext of that statement? The subtext is you should be happy you have something. You should stay in your place that you are reduced in many ways to a singular purpose. And that is one of entertainment. Very famously, Laura Ingram, the Fox News host told LeBron James to shut up and dribble when he was publicly critical of Donald Trump. He wonderfully reappropriated the comment and made a three part series documentary about athletes and activism called Shut Up and Dribble. But this was racialized because what does Laura Ingram say? She says that Drew Brees, who spoke out about his stance on politics, should be allowed to have his view, but LeBron James should shut up and dribble. The women of the WNBA have been true leaders in this push for social justice over the last year and a half. They've conducted media blackouts. They've left the court during the national anthem. They've spoke out publicly in support of Black Lives Matters. They've worn t-shirts as I showed you in the picture in the beginning, representing the seven bullets that were unloaded into the back of Jacob Blake. Meyer Moore from Minneapolis, she sat out to overturn the conviction of Jonathan, Jonathan Irons, who had been wrongfully convicted of burglary. She was successful and got him out of jail and in perhaps one of the most beautiful love stories ever, they are now married. But players in the WNBA, both black and white, have argued that much of the criticism that they've had to deal with is because they are, quote, too black and too queer. And so you have a fourth consciousness added on to what they're trying to do, another identity, the identity of being part of an LGBTQ community and the kind of backlash that they have had to deal with and that they courageously do deal with in their acts to create social justice. So what do we know? We know that criticism of activism and suggestions that black athletes stay in their place of athletics instead of acting as activists reduces the black body to a singular purpose. In this case, it's entertainment. We know that their actions remind us that change is possible because we see the change. And we know that the courage required for their actions should be acknowledged and admired. They are taking a stand, it requires courage, and we should acknowledge them for that. Non-Black athletes have also been politically outspoken, and we should acknowledge them for that. And this continued activism yields triumphs. It yields triumphs back then and now. Wilma Rudolph, who won three gold medals in the 1960 Olympics in Rome, came home to segregated Clarksburg, Clarksville, Tennessee. And she said this, they wanted to give her a parade in her honor. And she said, there's no way I'm participating in that parade if it's segregated. And so there was the first integrated parade in Clarksburg, Clarksville, Tennessee because of her stance. And they even had an integrated dinner after that because Wilma Rudolph took a stand 
because she revolted against an established norm. We know that because of Jackie Robinson's courage, his activism, the idea that the Major League Baseball was one time excluded African-Americans is asinine. Because of his courage, he is honored each year on April 15th when everyone in the league dons a shirt with his number, 42 on it. We know that those activist athletes in the NFL have pushed the NFL to create change. The NFL now engages in social activism where they invest dollars in economically marginal marginalized communities. They are helping black and brown people to invest in businesses. They are creating space for their athletes to be able to engage in community activism without a backlash. The MLB last year posted an ad, one team, one dream, be the change. And most recently, the MLB agreed that the voter suppression rules in Georgia, the laws that were just passed, were facially neutral. On their face, they seem to be non-discriminatory, but in application, we're serving to discriminate and will serve to discriminate against Black people. And the MLB has moved the All-Star Game out of Georgia as a result. Stadiums this past election were used as polling places because of those athletes who pushed the leagues to do that. Major sporting leagues investing money in dismantling structural racism in different ways. They are recognizing the humanity of their players. Those players are joining the voices of people across the country and across the world in peaceful protest and exposure that have yielded visible action over this past year and a half. They have revolted against a structure of racial terror and structural inequality once again and their actions are creating change. They are working to dismantle racial alterity and white supremacy. And in closing, I leave you with this. Should you ever get discouraged with the state of the world, James Baldwin reminds us, for this is your home, my friend, do not be driven from it. Great people have done great things here and will again, and we can make America what America must become. Thank you. So now I welcome any questions or comments and I'll open the chat box on my end so I can see them. And I think we have the ability for people to, thank you, Maury, to um, raise their hand and ask a question themselves or those of you who are in person. I don't know if you have a mic you can come up to and ask a question or, or give us a comment. It says, Dr. Scott, uh, thank you for this presentation. Are you, uh, as you draw attention to the revolting black athletes, do you also see a steady undercurrent of non-revolting black athletes? Are there periods you can identify in the 20th and 21st centuries when black athletes were less active? For, and actually before I even read that, I was thinking of Michael Jordan. Do you see athletes as reflecting moments of activism in society or leading? So let's start with the last part first, great questions. I see them both as reflecting moments of activism in society and of leading. It speaks to the power of their platform. So in many ways, whether it's in the 1960s or the 1940s or currently, they are responding to other waves of activism, but they are also creating new waves. So through their platform and through their visibility, they are making people say, okay, we need to act in a particular way. We have to understand that those uh, people who integrated different sport leagues, whether it was Althea Gibson winning the, um, the first black woman to win Wimbledon, whether it was Jackie Robinson, or the slew of black players who were the first ones to integrate the SEC for football or the ACC. They too were activists and their actions should be seen as activism, that they were able to, able to slowly break down racial barriers. Now, do all athletes engage in this? No, there is a risk that is to be paid very often or a price that is to be paid very often when athletes are involved in activism. Um, I visit the University of Alabama, for instance, when I am on a pilgrimage, I'm a resident historian, as was mentioned, for a civil rights pilgrimage. And we've had athletes tell us that the coaches have very clearly encouraged them in the past to not be involved in any kind of activism. And what's the price to be paid? Well, they're not sure you're not going to be played. Who knows what could happen if you engage in that? So it is a very challenging choice for people to make. If a college student is going to college on a scholarship, it's understandable that they may be afraid to engage in a level of activism that's going to have a backlash on them. Those are the ones who we have to make understand 
that there are different ways to engage in your community. And there are different acts that you can engage in. Mentoring is a form of social activism, for instance. Michael Jordan very openly said that he would not engage in any kind of activism. If the story is true, he basically said, Republicans and Democrats buy my shoes, so I'm going to stay out of uh, certain conflicts. I think in the last year, he's been a little bit more vocal, but there are many who have chosen to remain kind of silent. Great question, thank you. Any other questions or comments, observations? I love that a black athlete course was started at your school in the 1970s. How fantastic. Probably, yeah, a reaction to what was happening in 68. Okay, I have a question. Absolutely. Um, what was the moment in your life that made you um, like know that studying African-American history and the sports and stuff is what you wanted to look into? Well, that's a great question. So probably many moments. I grew up um, in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, a very, very racist space where I was called the N-word and Blackie and all kinds of things all the time when I was young. Um, and as I started to grow and when I became actually 15 and I read the autobiography of Malcolm X and a couple of years before that I read The Color Purple. And so that reading coupled with what happened to me in my past, I decided that if I could teach people about the history of African Americans, that I could work to begin to dismantle racism. And I still hold on to that. I don't think that it is, a, um, it is an unreachable task. Education is absolutely key. How do I integrate athletics into that? I have always been um, athletic. I just finished coaching actually high school sports about a year ago after my twins graduated. They're now engaged in sports and track um, in college. My brother, from the time I was five years old, played football and then he played in the NFL. My husband played at college football. So I've always been engaged in athletics. And so it was kind of a natural uh, transfer in me understanding the importance of athletics in our society. And it was really when I started teaching a course on the civil rights movement at the University of Washington many years ago that I started to very fully appreciate and recognize the power of athletics and how it's much more than just a game. Let's see. Uh, what factors do you see as contributing to that? I've noticed that Black college athletes are more vocal and activist now. What factors do you think contribute to that? So I think some of the things that can, yes, social media, but also the visibility of people like um, the WNBA, like uh, people in the NBA, LeBron James, people in the NFL, who are many of their uh, heroes, many of the Black college students' heroes. Seeing them provides those students with courage, but not just that. Also, what has been happening in our country in the last year. They are vocal because when people are watching George Floyd be lynched on television, it has pushed a lot of people, regardless of race or ethnicity, into a moment of really trying to advocate for themselves and for others in a different kind of way. And so Black college athletes are no exception. They saw that and many of them recognized their platform. I think with the Pac-12, they signed a uh, Black college football player signed a Pac that they would not play, for instance, until they knew that it was going to be safe for them to play in uh, this COVID pandemic because they said this COVID pandemic is disproportionately impacting people from our community. So if you are not going to make sure we're safe, we're not going to play. That took a lot of courage. That was incredible. And that pushed the Pac-12 to ensure their safety or uh, to some degree. Thank you. I'm so glad you learned a lot. And there's so much more. I wish I could go on and on and on about so many of these stories. So, and I encourage you to continue to, to look into them. And if you have any other questions about any of the things that I've talked about or learning about resources, I am happy to um, be available. Dr. Stevenson has my email. I think we have another question. Um, so do you think that the companies, the powers that be are actually, you know, actually fighting for social injustice, racial injustice, or is it a charade trying to keep us interested, the black dollar and everything, keep us, you know, around. So I think there it's I think it sometimes can be a little of both. I think some are actually moved to do things because there's been a shift in their soul, an awakening for a lot of people. I mean, I see it even I do a lot of public lecturing and I see it in people who come to those public lectures who say I essentially lived a life of ignorance. I didn't realize this, I didn't realize that, and now I want to know better and I want to do better. So I think a lot of people who are engaged in corporate efforts to affect change, it's very earnest. I think for some, 
possibly, yeah, it's appeasing people at the moment, but that still can be turned into a useful moment. So if they're attempting to appease people by creating uh, more job opportunities for people of color, well, hell, we'll take that and turn that into something life-changing for generations to come. That's a great question. What steps must athletes continue to take in order to see effective change regardless of level? I think to remain engaged, to remain vocal, the more people who engage it, the more it becomes um, almost a normal expectation of those athletes, that, that it becomes to some degree more of a, of a thing that's seen as not so uh, marginalized. That yes, we expect that athletes are going to speak out if they need to. We are not going to place them in a particular box and say their body is only good for one thing. But regardless of level, one of the things that they need to sustain that ability to speak up is mentorship. So if any of you are in a position to be able to mentor somebody, to be able to allow them to continue to do that, that's something we should all do. I started a program when I was at the University of Washington and now I have it here at Hood College called Community Ambassadors Mentoring Program. And it's a program that largely takes student athletes and connects them with economically marginalized youth in the community. And so it's teaching leadership skills and also making that those making sure that those youth see themselves as college bound. And I did it when I did it at the University of Washington. Uh, several of the students who went through the program ended up becoming professional football players. And three of them started their own. I had eight students who did it. Three of them started their own foundations that are mentoring foundations. And so if we can teach students, teach young people and older people what to do, then we can continue to pay it forward. It's all of our responsibility to create a world of equity. It's all of our responsibility to take care of our fellow man, not just people who have a very broad platform, not just people who have millions of dollars. All of us can do something to create change. We just have to figure out what that something is for us. I will take the liberty to ask a question. Okay. Let me shift this a little bit because you, you did show a couple of pictures, for example, Peter Norman. Mm -hmm. And so we can talk about, I can throw the name Pee Wee Reese out. Mm -hmm. And these white athletes who really a long time ago, it was really anathema to think about joining this struggle. But more recently, Chris Long and others have stood out can you talk a little bit about some of these white athletes who were willing to kind of cross the line and maybe some kind of repercussions they experienced in the past, as opposed to why more white athletes today are willing to become a part of the struggle? Absolutely. So that's why I wanted to open the, the conversation with the two pictures that I showed to, to, to acknowledge that the conversation tonight is about the history of black athletes but to acknowledge that there are a number of non-Black athletes, uh, white, Asian, uh, Native American, Latino, who are involved in social justice work. And so that is another part of that narrative. Now, as you very precisely mentioned, uh, and the first one you mentioned was from a friend of Jackie Robinson who stood by his side. Indeed, there have been white athletes who have spoken out and spoken up and stood by Black athletes Historically, when you think about, for instance, the, AC, the ACC and the SEC and the Southwest Conference football programs being integrated in the 1960s and early 1970s, it also required the courage of white coaches who often put their careers on the line to make sure that those black players could play and pushed against the trustees, the boards of trustees and said, this is what we're going to do. Branch Rickey received death threats when he brought Jackie Robinson into the league. And so indeed, there have been allies along the way who have helped in that fight. Why are there more allies today? Because America was a hell of a lot more racist back then than it is today, quite honestly. And because there is a level of normalcy to some degree, more acceptability of people standing together and because young people are more enlightened in many ways in this generation than they were several generations ago. For instance, uh, the acceptance in so many high schools of, of uh, uh, children who identify as LGBTQ is so much different, so much better today than even when I was in high school. Now, some of the young people might think I'm really old, but I'm not that old. So high school for me wasn't that long ago. 
So the world is changing for the better. As much change as we still have to do, and as many horrible things as happened today, we have come a long way. And so we have to recognize that. And so that is where we are today. And allyship is key to this. This is not one person's problem. This is a human problem. This is something that we all have a responsibility in changing. And the courage required from people, regardless of race, to engage in this should be acknowledged and commended. It still burns me up to see that white NFL athletes will put their hand on the shoulder of a black athlete taking a knee or who will link arms, but I have yet to see a white NFL player take a knee. There actually have been a number of white NFL players who have taken a knee. I wanna say, I, I think it might've been my beloved Seahawks, but I might be a little bit biased. Um, and some high school players. I actually almost included a picture here of that where they are becoming increasingly unified. And, and one of the things I've heard from, um, I, I work with three former athletes who are creating actually a foundation right now to help teach young athletes how to create foundations and how to maneuver in the sphere of um, community engagement. And they say that a lot of white athletes come to them and say, I, I wanna learn more. I just want to understand. And so that's why education is really key. So even coming to a conversation like this, this evening is really key in breaking down barriers and teaching people to understand. Said I'm waiting on the white pros. I've seen a number, yeah, I've seen a number more. So I think, uh, you know, with Goodell apologizing to Colin Kaepernick, wow, that's a fall down moment. Some would say a little bit too late, but Kaepernick has really become a wonderful symbol and, and of encouragement, so. Do you have a class that teaches how to start a foundation and mentoring program? No, it's not a class. It is, uh, I'm consulting with an organization um, and the name of the organization actually is commonpower.org. So it's one of the things that they have engaged in doing. It's, it's the organization for which I'm a fellow right now. I was just named a fellow for it. And so we are working with athletes. Yes, commonpower.org. Thank you. We are working with athletes to teach them how to be increasingly engaged. Do I see any limitations on the ability of athletes to impact social issues? Yeah, many of the limitations are um, some of the backlash. I mean, we can't expect people to risk everything. You know, people have personal choices. People have reasons why they're doing things. If, if there is a student, for instance, my husband went to college on a, uh, an athletic scholarship um, for football, a full ride. He didn't particularly like football, but he came from a very poor family. And that was the way you can see, actually, I just saw it behind my head. That's one of his game balls. You can see uh, he came from a poor family and that was his only option for having um, college fully paid for. And so that would be a lot Yes, Warren Scott, indeed. <laughs> that would be a lot for um, somebody to risk. Um, he still got involved in activism. At one point, he overtook the administrator's office. I'm not suggesting that anyone does that. I know everything's fine there, so don't do that. But he took a risk when he did that. He could have lost his scholarship, but, uh, but he didn't. But those are um, some of the limitations, the backlash. Okay, Langston Frazier has a good question above. Have students at HBCUs pushed positive change, especially with being in a place where black excellence is widely accepted, but outside the college community? Well, HBCU students, if you look at the great question, if you look at the history of activism, particularly in the 1960s, students at H and the 50s, students at HBCUs led the charge. Diane Nash went to an HBCU. John Lewis went to an HBCU. So many, Julian Bond, so many of the activists who are high profile, who led sit-ins, who led all kinds of activism in the 60s, went to Marion Barry, went to HBCUs. That's exactly correct. And so, um, and at the time, many of them got kicked out of the school for engaging in activism. So HBCUs have been real leaders in a push for social and racial justice. Great questions, everyone. Thank you. Are there any other? I hear someone talking, kind of. Yes, you have another student coming. Absolutely, well, wonderful. Okay, you um, I read something about um, not, I read something about um, Project Pilgrimage. Yes. Um, you work on the uh, these journeys and trips, um, looking at civil rights movements and stuff. Can you talk more about that or what that is? 
Absolutely. So projectpilgrimage.org. That's something you guys, it's a Seattle based organization. And twice a year, except now with the uh, pandemic, they won't do their next trip until the spring of, of um, 2022. But twice a year, they take a group of interracial, um, intergenerational people through the South. And so I'm the resident historian for that. And so we go to places like where Emmett Till was murdered, where Meg Grevers was murdered. We meet with uh, civil rights activists. We travel the whole time with very famous civil rights activists, including, for instance, Bob Zellner, whose movie Son of the South just came out, Dr. Lafayette. Uh, Bernard Lafayette, one of the women who was in the 16th Street Baptist Church, Dr. Carolyn McKinstry, when it exploded, she travels with us. And we learn not only about the civil rights movement and what people went through, we go to Montgomery, we go to the Equal Justice Initiative, to the Mass Incarceration Museum, but we learn about what lessons we can take from that historical moment and apply them to the present. So it really trains people in the art of community change. And so it is an application that's open to everyone. They are particularly fond, I should tell all of you, of college students, young people going on this trip. And so it is projectpilgrimage.org is the, um, and if you want more information, please feel free to contact me personally. And I know Hood College, for instance, we send to, uh, two students on each um, trip and the price is reduced. And so the students who go from Hood College don't pay a penny. So the college pays a portion of it and Project Pilgrimage pays the rest. So we really encourage young people to go. And even older people, if you're not in college, if you can't afford to go on it, you can ask for a scholarship and not have to pay. So it really is open to everyone. Um, and if you can pay three or $5,000, then they ask you to do that to cover the costs of other people. So um, if you are interested, any of you, uh, are there any of the college students here or others, please check out Project Pilgrimage. Great question. And Common Power, I should tell you also about something called Action Academy that they have that is designed for college students. You apply for it. There's one coming this summer and you engage in uh, learning about civic engagement and voting. It's a six week program, three hours a week. And at the end of it, you get a $750 stipend for having gone through it. Okay, let's see. I like you mentioned of white high school coaches and what they've been through. There's a book there for sure. <laughs> Absolutely there is, right? Because local teams would not play as team because of a black player on this team. Gonzaga College High School. Thank you, Joe uh, Kosick, I think it is. Thank you. Can I have your contact information? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put my um, email right here. So it's hood, scott, or scott at hood.edu, but note that there are three T's because often people will send it to Scott with two T's and it uh, ends up going, I don't know where, whoever gets it never sends it to me. So there it is. Scott with three T's at hood.edu. Please feel free to contact me or I, um, I'm gonna put my Twitter handle because I post a lot of different activities that I'm doing or others on Twitter as well. Thank you for asking that. Any other questions or comments? This was good. Thanks. <laughs> Very, very good. It felt like uh, in a very short period of time, you did a 12 week semester class. So. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. I think everyone here was definitely enlightened by your presentation and your comments. And I particularly like your perspective on hope. I think within the last week, we have on the one hand seen hope with the verdict, but even that very day of the verdict, uh, there was a shooting and there's continued to seemingly be every other day, another shooting. Um, but I appreciate your reminder, at least for me, that all is not lost and that as educators, we need to continue uh, to be a part of the struggle. So thank, thank you. you again. We really appreciate, appreciate it. And we will be back in touch with you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that very much. Thank you everyone for attending and please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Indeed, history bends toward justice. Thank you for those, those words.